Hello everyone, today we're going to be taking a look at part of the intuitive surgical robot arm. Specifically, this is the portion of the robot that goes inside the human body. If you're not familiar with intuitive surgical robots, I put some links to videos in the description. So just for some scale, these are about 22 inches long, and this carbon fiber shaft is about a little over 8 millimeters in diameter. And these instruments have three main areas. There's the base that clips into the large overhead robot arm, there's a carbon fiber tube, and then there's the end effector. So it would be a hole in the patient's skin about the size of a nickel or something, and this actually slides through there into the abdomen or whatever area that they're doing uh, surgery on. And the entry into the body is the fixed rotation point where the shaft rotates and slides through. So these robots give surgeons seven degrees of freedom per arm. The degrees of freedom are in and out, and then two degrees of rotation uh, about that fixed point at the, um, at the skin. And those three degrees of freedom are controlled with the large overhead robot arm that these are attached to. That larger arm has many more than three degrees of freedom, but once it's positioned over the patient in that correct location, the arm is limited to those three degrees of freedom. Then there's also four degrees of freedom within the instrument, which is what we're gonna take a look at in detail. The distal end of the device is called the endo wrist, uh, which has the gripper and uh, sort of a wrist mechanism. Um, and then that's all controlled at the proximal end of the device, which uh, has four knobs basically. Um, so these uh, control each axis of the device, and these are controlled by servo motors in the arm so that they sort of lock into there. So there are a lot of features that make this device pretty extraordinary. Firstly, this is an entirely passive device. So this instrument doesn't have any electronics controlling it. Um, all the robotics are controlled through steel cables, sort of like a puppet. Uh, we'll see that in more detail when I take it apart, including some of the clever design features they use to ensure that you still have higher accuracy, even without sensors. It does have a circuit board and you can see the pins there, uh, but that's uh, just for keeping track of how many times the instrument has been used, as well as presumably for making sure that no one uses knockoff instruments, uh, since Intuitive makes a lot of their money by selling these instruments. The device is able to be completely passive, mostly because all the joints are designed to be very stiff. This means that even as load is applied to the end effector, error between the input and output stays fairly small. There is, however, still some error, and that final amount of error gets corrected for by the human in the loop. So instead of an electronic control system, the human is looking at the end effector through the endoscope camera, uh, and they intuitively correct for that deflection under load and the small amount of backlash and stiction. So that brings us to the next incredible feature, which is that these are entirely disposable. The instruments can be used up to 10 times before being thrown away. In between uses, they're sterilized using an autoclave with steam at 133 degrees Celsius for four minutes, and that kills everything that could be living on this. That means that every material in this needs to be able to withstand this extreme environment for at least 10 cycles. Uh, the materials have to also be cheap enough that Intuitive can make a profit on these since the hospital only gets 10 uses out of them and doesn't want to spend too much money on them. The next feature is just the size of it. Everything is very small and precise. The overall size of it is very large, but the, all the important bits are really, really small. You can see here the size of the end effector compared with an American dime and quarter. So since these are disposable, there are a lot of used units available on eBay for pretty cheap. I got two of these for $40, although most of these are listed for $40 each. Um, I was surprised I couldn't find any videos or pictures of the insides of these, and so that's why I wanted to make this video. I got two different instrument types. One is a regular gripper called the Rosano forceps. The other is a cauterizing device called precise bipolar forceps. The cauterizing ones are able to apply high frequency and high voltage to the tissue uh, to seal off blood vessels. This one is bipolar as opposed to monopolar, so each of the gripper halves are at different electrical potentials. Um, I believe bipolar cautery is preferred because there's no need to have a return electrode somewhere on the body. Uh, the electrical circuit is closed right where the cautery is desired. They do also make monopolar instruments though where you close the circuit somewhere else on the human body with a large electrode plate. The bipolar instrument is neat because the most distal wrist joint is made of plastic instead of metal to insulate the two halves of the gripper from each other and from the rest of the device. Since the radius where force is applied is so small, 
the forces on this part could be relatively large. So it is probably some sort of high performance plastic. Um, since it's orange and partially transparent, I'm guessing it's a glass filled PEI rather than a peak or PAI. Uh, there's tons of different types of high performance cl plastics though, so I couldn't know for sure without a chemical analysis. This is a drawing from an intuitive surgical patent showing the endo wrist up close. The four degrees of freedom are the twist about the axis of the shaft, the wrist motion, and the two independent grippers which rotate orthogonal to the other two axes. And the center of rotation of the grippers and the wrists do not intersect. And this is another of their patent drawings which shows the cable and pulley configuration. It's not very intuitive, so I don't think this diagram is particularly useful in understanding how the pulleys are set up, but I think it can be useful once you do understand just as a reference. This is what the wrist looks like in motion. And these are the independent gripper jaws. All the silver cables are for actuating the joints, and the black wires are specifically for the cautery power supply. Those wires are not directly driven by pulleys like the cables are, so sometimes they lose tension slightly. I definitely recommend watching this part in full screen to see all the cables moving. Um, based on like the texture of the cables, you can see how they move within the device. And here's how the non-cauterizing gripper looks. This is essentially the same as the cauterizing ones. They just have a slightly less wide area um, at the grippers because they don't need room for the wires for the cautery power. This is how the cables for the wrist motion are set up. This shows a single cable um, that would just be able to actuate it in one direction. Uh, and the red pulley shown there is attached to the moving frame. This shows the cable layout for the grippers. This would also just be one cable for one of the grippers. Uh, in total, there are four cables for the two grippers. Um, so the blue pulley is on the moving frame and the red pulley in this case is on the static frame. So ideally with a device like this, there wouldn't be any coupling between axes. So when you uh, rotated the control knob on one axis, it wouldn't affect any of the other axes. Uh, but this design actually does have coupling between the wrist motion and the gripper motion. Um, and that's because of this setup here. This view is rotated 90 degrees from what we were just looking at. So here you can see the ferrule where the one of the wrist cables is locked in place. Then on the side you can see the four guide pulleys and the other four guide pulleys that uh, we were just looking at in the previous view. This clip shows the coupling between the two axes. So I'm only moving the knobs for the wrist axis in this case, and the two gripper axes are moving at the same time. I think the best way to understand how this works is to just look really closely at the parts that are moving. So here's about two minutes of super close-up footage. 
Okay, so let's start taking this apart. So looking at the end of the device, we've got two holes here. So I thought those might be related to how you get into the device, um, or maybe they're for disabling it or something, but turns out they're actually a useful feature. So the actual way that you get into the device is by just unclipping four plastic tabs. Um, pretty standard for most plastic devices. Um, just a little bit of prying and the uh, blue plastic part just pops right off. So you can see the little blue plastic piece that dropped out. That holds a tube in place, which is what I accidentally drilled out. That's for cleaning the device. And we'll see that uh, later in the teardown. Okay, so now that we're inside the device, we can see a couple of wires and a circuit board. Um, the wires are for the cautery portion of the device. They're not connected at all to the circuit board. The circuit board has a memory chip on it and a Zener diode for ESD protection. And these four pins are ground, one wire communication for the memory chip, and then the other two pins are actually shorted together, which I assume is just to detect uh, if the device is connected. I was able to find the specific memory chip that they use. It's pretty neat because it has add-only memory. The DaVinci instruments can only be used 10 times before throwing them away, so this memory chip lets them enforce that limit. There is also a magnet that's embedded in the plastic here, or a piece of magnetized material. I'm really not sure what that's for. Now let's pause here to take a look at how the pulleys are constructed. Here we're looking at the pulley that twists the whole shaft. At the top, there's a very small bearing pressed into the plastic. The bearing is held in place and preloaded by the aluminum shaft itself. The shaft is swaged over the bearing to permanently hold it in place without any fasteners. On the bottom, there's also a much larger bearing, which we'll see once we take this all apart. In the middle, there's the drive pulleys. I think the more accurate term might be capstan, but for simplicity, I'm just gonna call them pulleys. There's actually two separate pulleys for each axis because there are two separate cables. One winds up while the other unwinds. They could just have this be one component, but the pulleys need to be separated to serve as the tensioning mechanism. The pulleys can be rotated relative to each other to tension the cables. You can actually see here that the pulleys are clocked slightly off from each other, which shows how that tensioning system works. The pulleys have split housings with screws that clamp on the shaft and keep them in place. And finally, the cables are threaded through a hole and held in place with a crimped ferrule on the end of the cable. And by the way, a ferrule is just a tube that you crimp over a wire cable. This other type of pulley is used for the other three axes. It's essentially the same, but the diameter of the pulley is much smaller and the ferrules are sticking out of the side. It's also interesting how much corrosion is built up on this pulley. This is presumably due to the galvanic corrosion between the aluminum pulley and the steel cable. So any anodization or coating that they applied to the cable or the pulley must have worn away, allowing current to flow and corrosion to appear. And I'm sure this is also amplified by being cleaned multiple times in an autoclave. Okay, so now we can continue taking apart the rest of this. So this is the tube that I was mentioning earlier. This is used for cleaning the device. Um, so basically you can inject water uh, or other cleaning agent all the way down the end of the tube. And so this tube actually extends through the entire length of the shaft. Um, I imagine that it also helps stabilize uh, all the cables going through the shaft. Um, you'll see when we take it all the way apart, um, they're just sort of hanging out in the shaft. And so this probably helps to keep them from banging around quite as much. So you can see it goes the entire length of the tube. Before taking it apart further, I wanted to check to see if there was continuity between the two pins of the cautery device, and they were still insulated. In order to get further into the device, we have to remove the swaging, keeping those bearings in place. So I just removed those with some clippers. Uh, you probably drilled them out as well. But this is a destructive disassembly process. Um, I also noticed there's a couple of washers underneath uh, the swaging in between the bearing and the swage. Um, I'm sort of curious why that is. It seems like that's almost an afterthought, um, like they needed some extra clearance there after they made the swaging process. The next step is to unclip some very stubborn plastic clips. Um, you can see I, there's some plastic shavings on the table there that was from drilling out some parts that I thought that might needed to be drilled out in order to get this off, but probably wasn't necessary, but it, it ended up coming off with just some uh, extra prying. And now we can see inside the device.
this is the pulley that we were looking at first, and you can see it's rolling and unrolling the twist axis of the device. So let's pause to take a look at this overhead view of all the pulleys. And so you can see all the pulleys, uh, the cables enter into the shaft uh, at this location. So the three smaller pulleys go around some guide pulleys to then enter the shaft. And the larger pulley doesn't actually go through any extra guide pulleys. It stays within this uh, portion of the device. And then you can also see the wires for the cautery device also enter here from the bottom. I removed all the guide pulleys from their posts. These are basically just plain bearings. Um, I think they're probably stainless steel. Um, and you can see they're quite rusted, actually, uh, which again is from the autoclaving process. Uh, by the way, this is this part here is what I drilled out earlier, which actually does have to be drilled out in order to be removed this way because um, it's molded in. Now you can start removing all the pulleys. So you can see when I unscrew this, they sort of unfurl from each other because there's a little bit of tension on there. And those are two separate pieces. Um, and they, they both come off completely. And the shaft here has some sort of interesting coating on it. It's really, really hard coating. But I'm pretty sure the shaft is some sort of aluminum. You can see the bearings there. So now as we undo all of these, it's starting to get pretty messy. All the cables just hanging out there. So it's time to start clipping those off so that we can get to the rest of the device. So these are actually some pretty tough steel, which does make sense since they need to be bent around really small radii um, all the time. So they have to have very high fatigue resistance. Once all the cables are cut, we can see that the end effector here loses a lot of its rigidity. And obviously there's cables sticking out everywhere. But I thought it was just really interesting that uh, a lot of the rigidity of the device itself comes from the tension of the cables. And now we can pull it out. So this is the moment where I was super surprised. I expected to just see cables in here, but um, it turns out that there's actually some solid steel rods going the entire length of this. Um, and so basically the cables are crimped at each end and there's a little bit of cable inside the tube, but um, the, the steel rods are uh, quite a bit larger in diameter. And so the reason for that is just to, um, presumably is to increase the stiffness of the system because you know there's about 20 inches of, of length there of excess cable that if you can make that stiffer, then why not? Um, you can see it's, about a millimeter, a little over a millimeter versus um, 0.45 millimeters. The end effector is actually just held in place with the tension of the cables and these keying features. And here's all the bearings with everything removed. The last step is to remove the shaft. The plastic drive pulley is just a slip fit uh, with keying features to transmit torque to the shaft. The shaft is also slip fit in the bearings with an aluminum liner. And there's a small step on the shaft to hold it in place axially. And these bearings are also press fit into the plastic part. That's all for now. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment section and I will see you next time.